two massively successful companies, a sprawling cast of characters, and mountains of cash. The history of Marvel vs. Capcom has dizzying heights and an ultimate landing place that's so depressing, it might as well be a Shakespearean tragedy. If I know Shakespeare, I thought I was about to kill everybody up in this bitch. <laughs> Which begs the question, how does all of this success result in a fighting game franchise that currently has almost no footprint in the fighting game ecosystem? Yeah, it sucks. While Marvel and Capcom both have lengthy histories in the gaming space, their joint ventures first started with the cult hit 1993 arcade game simply titled The Punisher. The game might not have set the world on fire, but it was a solid beat em up and was viewed by both companies as a successful collaboration upon its release. This cleared the path for what some still consider a high watermark in the annals of fighting games, X-Men Children of the Atom. Originally produced in an effort for X-Men the animated series synergy, the game features fairly smooth gameplay, iconic characters, and a combo system that can be performed in midair, something that would become a staple of the franchise going forward. Capcom would expand out of the X-Men business by producing Marvel superheroes. Based off the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, the game saw all your favorite Marvel characters, including Spider-Man, Captain America, and Wolverine, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thanos for the fate of the universe. But it would be the franchise's first full-blown crossover that most consider the beginning of the MVC gaming empire, 1996's X-Men vs. Street Fighter. This game would take all of the best elements from the previous outings, including literally just recycling many of the sprites from Marvel Super Heroes and Street Fighter Alpha 2, and combine them into a walloping good time of a fighting game. In an unexpectedly cool twist, all of the voice actors from the 90s show provided the dialogue for the game. The most controversial decision that the designers made in the process of creating X-Men vs. Street Fighter is that many of the now beloved and iconic Street Fighter characters had to be almost completely reimagined in order to hold their own against the overpowered stats of Marvel's Omega level threats. The cast featured 17 characters, 8 Marvel and 9 Capcom. However, gone would be the puny standard Hadouken and in its place, the Super Hadouken. Capcom was giving their characters a powers upgrade in order to take on Marvel's Merry Mutants. A side effect of this upgrade was that multiple characters were accidentally given infinite combos, which caused Capcom to have to reissue the game multiple times to avoid this outcome. But don't worry, everyone was still friends in the end. You might be thinking to yourself, wow, that's a kinda over the top way to make sure everyone seems like they're getting along. And well, there's a specific reason for that. X-Men vs. Street Fighter came out two years after ESRB was established, thanks mostly to our friends across the street, Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat! Thus, the iconic Ryu and Scott Summers handshake. This game also introduced a tag team mechanic, which allowed the player to select two characters from either side of the aisle and switch between both of them live during the match. At this time, this was considered a revolutionary move, and some argue that it saved the game from failure. You see, the game was mildly popular when it was initially released in Japan and North America. However, after several months, the game had such positive word of mouth that it became a wild success. So why stop there, right? In 1997, Capcom released Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter. This time, same as the transition from Children of the Atom to Marvel Super Heroes, the majority of the X characters were left by the wayside in favor of Captain America, Spidey, and other House of Ideas stalwarts. The only major improvement that the game had brought to the table was the idea of variable assists. Again, something that would be used extensively in the franchise going forward. Ultimately, this game was looked at as something of a step backwards. While the franchise as a whole was bringing in large amounts of money and developing a solid fan base, Capcom thought that the gaming meta was getting out of hand. They needed to roll the powers, abilities, and frequency of the combos down in order to ensure long-term franchise stability. The fans were loud and clear though. This was the wrong move and it's hurt the legacy of Marvel vs. Street Fighter. So when it came time to step back into development, the team had one goal, to make things even crazier, which is exactly what they did with the first game to actually bear the name Marvel vs. Capcom. Marvel vs. Capcom, Clash of Superheroes. Despite being the third entry into the franchise, many consider this the first MVC game. Released in 1998 with a roster of 15 characters and 20 unplayable guest characters, this is the game where the endless iteration and tinkering that Capcom loves to do finally paid off in full. The game is smooth, frenetic, and almost instantly developed a massive fan base. They shipped close to 3,000 arcade units to the US on launch, a feat that bested Street Fighter III, which was released roughly 12 months earlier. 
Capcom knew they had lightning in a bottle, so they ran with it. They rolled right into a sequel with the ambition of creating the Godfather 2 of fighting games. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 New Age of Heroes was released in 2000, only two years later, and is still considered one of the fighting game genre's absolute best efforts. With the immediate upgrade of three playable characters at your beck and call, MVC 2 is a battle cry to maximalism on every front. From the variable assist combos to the three-on-three -three strategic component, the game is an overture to bounding chaos and multicolored explosions. And that's to say nothing of the fact that this game fixes the main issue the previous one struggled with, overpowered characters dominating the tournament landscape. There are characters in MVC 2 that aren't particularly strong by themselves, like Captain Commando, but when paired with certain characters, like Cable, they turn out to be a highly effective ranged combo tag team. This innovation created multitudes of gaming combinations and hours of replayability. As an additional level of complexity, when calling on for variable assist, the playable characters can receive damage, meaning that these combos need to be used very strategically. And to add a little cherry on top of how amazing this game is, the cast of playable characters was expanded all the way to 56. Now you can live out your sentient cactus wearing a sombrero dreams. Why would you settle for the power fantasy of living as Dr. Doom when you can be a Mingo, the one true ruler of all space and time, huh? Answer me that, internet. Marvel vs. Capcom was a staple of the annual fighting game competition, EVO, for close to a decade after its release, an accomplishment that should serve as tacit approval of the game's considerable impact on the genre. Tragically, MVC2 was not even attempted to be bested for nearly 10 years. Shortly after the release of the game, Marvel opted not to renew their licensing agreement, instead opting to take a lucrative deal with Activision. Eventually, EA's Marvel Nemesis Rise of the Imperfects was released to, you know, uh, not a particularly positive response. Ah, oh, well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. I'm not the same man you knew before. Yeah, you telling me? However, Marvel and Capcom would eventually reteam and produce Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Fate of Two Worlds. The biggest departure that this game brings forward is its art style. By 2011, the 2D sprites of the previous entries were outdated, and so Capcom decided to opt for a cel-shaded 3D CG style for the game. Does it work? Well, that's in the eye of the beholder, but I'd be lying if I said that when I picture a Marvel vs. Capcom game in my head, I picture anything other than 2D illustrations and Cap screaming, <laughs> The game attempts to bring what made the previous entries in the franchise great into the modern gaming landscape. There are some interesting ideas put forward in terms of fighting combos like snapbacks, hyper combos, and crossover combinations, but there's something that just feels like a step back for MVC3. It featured a roster of 36 characters and a design scheme that mostly seemed to work for longtime fans. Maximize gameplay depth while minimizing complexity. The game received positive reviews and sold roughly 3 million copies prior to release. But here's where Capcom does their Capcom thing. They released a new version of the game, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, in November of 2011, with 12 new characters. Is it fun to see Hawkeye, Ghost Rider, and Nova show up in a Marvel vs. Capcom game? Yes, but at what cost? You're gonna release the same game just seven months after release? This left a bad taste in players' mouths. But thanks again to Evo, the game's legacy has been refurbished. After being a staple of the tournament for years, it's looked at fondly by the fighting game community. Too bad the same can't be said for the next entry into the franchise. Marvel vs. Capcom, Infinite. So do you take like regular batteries? Released in September of 2017, six years after its predecessor, due to Disney pulling the license back in-house and then subsequently shutting down Disney Interactive, Infinite is a letdown on just about every level. A clunky story, limited cast of characters, and weird gameplay decisions top the list of grievances. But then, of course, there's Spider-Man's bizarrely overdeveloped traps. No X-Men or Fantastic Four, and the fact that this game is just a redo of Infinity Gauntlet. Again, presumably to tie into the launch of the Infinity War movie, the list of depressing turns that Infinite chose to take is seemingly endless. Whereas MVC2 felt like the perfect fighting game made by fans for fans, Infinite felt like a piece of content produced by the guiding soulless glove of Mickey Mouse. You think God is in control here? <laughs> I am in control. I've been in control since the 50s in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> Ultimately, Infinite would be the last game in the franchise for the foreseeable future. 
It's generally thought of as a disappointing and rushed effort, so much so, in fact, that it was not selected to be a featured game at EVO. When looking at the gaming landscape today, it's pretty startling how hard fighting games have fallen off. They're the red-headed stepchild of the industry now. MVC is one of a few handful of franchises that could have staved off that regrettable status quo. MVC2 alone is credited with extending the popularity of the genre by at least five years. The fact that this 30-year franchise is currently sitting as the laughing stock of a criminally underappreciated genre is a tragedy. Marvel vs. Capcom should be the gold standard of fighting game franchises. But instead, due to a concoction of licensing issues, poorly received sequels, and corporate mismanagement, the franchise is relegated to the dustbin of the industry. A relic of nostalgia bait YouTube think pieces instead of the thriving heartbeat of the fighting game community. Well, that's all we have for this week. Who did you main in MVC2? Do you think we'll get another good Marvel vs. Capcom game again? If so, comment down below. And as always, please subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this.